All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our midweek prayer meeting and Bible study. Good to see each and every one of you. I'm not sure exactly if this is going through on YouTube in a sense of our audio. It is? We're good? Okay, wonderful. Um, So to my mom who is requesting sunshine in my soul, we will sing that next week, but we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. So um, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. I see that there's still some people getting ready to come in, so that's okay. We'll get started with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together tonight to study your word, to pray, and to encourage one another in our journeys of faith. So Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified by all that's said and done tonight, and Lord, that you just continue to go before us and guide and direct our steps. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand together. The song that we're going to be singing is going to eventually be up on the screen. All right, here we go. We'll just wait just a little bit. It's a little bit of a mystery of why it does this. It plays peekaboo on us. Okay. All right, here we go. We will glorify. Let's sing together. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him. Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, he is Lord of all who live, he is Lord above the universe, all praise to him we give, alleluia to the King of kings, alleluia to the Lamb, alleluia to the You may be seated. Thank you, Sue, for playing. Do we have any testimonies tonight? Any answers to prayer? Updates, perhaps? Yes, Joan? My doctor let me go. <laughs> my, back, my back is good, so I don't have to get another shot. I can go back to the physical therapy to strengthen. And that's good. And Christopher is doing well. He knows to see the podiatrist tomorrow for his foot. Um, I just want to pray for Roger and Ron for helping Sunday with Christopher. Um, it's one of those things that happens. And yep. just, I'm just glad he didn't done all He was fine after that. Calm down. He was fine. Good. I'm glad it wasn't anything more serious than that. No, a seizure or anything. No, just having a, a moment. We all have. Exactly. It was that. It was. Anyone else with a testimony or answer to prayer? Yes, let us see. No, but I have a request. Joan, can I have you a second shot? <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. Okay, thanks. <laughs> the Lord answers prayers. Yes. Anybody else? Yes, Georgiana. Um, Joanne called me last week. And wanted me to come up on Saturday to help her go look at an apartment. So I said, I'd do it. And then I thought about filling up my tank with gas. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay. So I'm mentally I'm trying to, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul in my head. And I got to work last Friday night. And everybody met me there. They're all smiles. They have this thing, if they go for I think, I don't know how long it is, a week, a month, without any customer complaints. They throw money into a big pot and put everybody's names in it and draw some names. So they threw all the money and I got a $50 gift card. Hey. I up my friend the gas got $2.30 to over. So I was just very Amen. Well, good. You have a good visit. Thank you. Yes, Joanne. Um, Joanne called me. 
Anybody else with a testimony in the prayer? All right. They don't have to speak out this time. Go in the back for a little bit. Have one and raise your hand for a few minutes. Do you? Our missionaries of belief are the Whippins. We supported them for a number of years. They have faithfully served in Mexico. Can you read to you the most recent prayer letter? As said before, some of our missionaries send monthly prayer letters. Some send every two months. Uh, and some missionaries send it about every quarter, so every three months. So this is kind of an update on what has happened from January to March. So, that, so they write, we're very thankful for continued attendance and faithfulness among our people since the start of 2022. It took a few months to get people used to the idea of being back in our church building, which the Lord has so graciously supplied during the past three years. When the pandemic started, we had only been in our building for about a year and a half, so it all still feels kind of new. Mm -hmm. We set up and take down everything, including all the chairs and the sound system every week, so we're grateful for the many helping hands. Most of our congregation is back in person with only a handful still online. Our midweek activities for ladies and men are online while our university students are back in person. We have Friday morning brunch before they start afternoon classes and we enjoy this special time of fellowship. So then they write a little bit about something that they would like to highlight is the faithfulness of our men. Back in January, they started a new Bible study, and that class has grown um, from just a handful of guys to a number of men that are coming ages 20 to 60. So they praise the Lord for that, including uh, two guys named Bernardo and Hector who help in the teaching and preaching, and other men who help prepare the food. In fact, they have a professional chef by the name of Ernesto who brings and is overseeing all of the food. Wouldn't that be a blessing to have? Well, we kind of have Spencer, so that's close enough, right? At any rate, um, just continue to pray for other outreach events that they have. They also want to thank the Lord for a woman named Cynthia Castillo, who is a fellow missionary, a longtime friend. Um, we've known Cynthia for a number of years, and she's been very helpful in their ministry, and they're going to be continuing to work with her. She's going to be leading the ladies in the Bible study and working in some of their other ministries that they have with their children. They end the letter by saying, we'd like to praise the Lord for the people who made decisions recently and will be baptized in the month of May. Pray as we continue to evangelize and disciple new believers and to reach our corner of Mexico City for Christ. We've included a map, which is just on this letter here, and I'll post this letter later, um, talking about kind of where their house is compared to the rest of uh, the community that they're really trying to reach for Christ. And so they're thankful for the opportunities that they've had in the post-COVID world and with the uncertainty of political and economic situations in Mexico, pray as we canvass this area and that people will respond to know the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you for your continued prayers and support, Mark and Donna Whippin. And so just continue to pray for them as they minister in a very, very large city of Mexico City. Okay? All right. Um, at this time, I'm going to... We, don't, we didn't have a bullet in this past week, and hopefully you had um, enjoyed the, the service. I was blessed by all the special music and uh, the good fellowship that we had um, for dinner and some of the other people that were able to be with us for that. Um, so I want to highlight not anything coming up other than the fact that uh, this coming Sunday will be our last life group meeting, so hopefully you're able to attend that in person and be part of that, and um, we're looking forward to, to that. Um, so on um, Monday of next week, we're heading out with all of the teens from our youth group and some who are in our school, and we're heading down to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So just pray for us uh, that we will have a good time together and that uh, we'll have safe travels and really just enjoy ourselves. We're only going to be gone for a uh, day and a half. A couple things I want to bring to your attention for prayer and for your consideration of being involved. Um, Yesterday, I spoke with someone from the Litchfield Historical Society, and they are asking that I speak at the Memorial Day event. So they want me to pray, speak, um, and then close the, the whole ceremony in prayer, okay? So, and I've done this in the past where I've been invited to do this. I've actually done this in tandem with another minister from uh, another church in Litchfield, but this year they've asked me to kind of be the only one up there. And, and I said, well, if you don't have a special speaker, I would be willing to speak as well, as long as I can say whatever I want. And they're like, oh, we would love that. So we'll see how that goes. 
Uh, but usually they ask like, either a politician or somebody who served in the military, or somebody who's gonna give some insight about something to do with Memorial Day, all right? Weird that it's doing a little bit more often, huh, Dave? Yeah. All right, trying to figure this out. Dave worked really hard the last couple of days trying to get this going, but just randomly going there. So there are some things else that I want to point out when this comes back, <laughs> if it ever comes back. Okay. Um, it will, I'm sure. <coughs> but so so we, we talked about this on Vision Sunday back in January, but on um, May 30th, that's that Monday. So we are going to do our, we're going to walk in the parade. We are going to, um, I'm going to really encourage our school families to be involved in this as well. I want to hand out uh, candy and tracks as well. But uh, we are going to be putting together, there we go. Welcome back. Um, we are going to put some things together um, concerning the float. I continue to pray for Brother Gordon. And uh, he seems to be doing better. Uh, I talked to him a little bit today. If you're watching, Gordon, we love you and we miss you. We're praying for you. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to put that float together and walk in the parade. So it, you, we normally meet here around 9, head over there. I think the parade officially starts around 10. And so it's all, our, our float is always well received. and opens doors of opportunities for us to be a testimony in our community and also acknowledging the fact that Memorial Day is something that we're doing to recognize our fallen soldiers. And so I think it's important to show our patriotism as well as being a good testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyways, that is something that hopefully we'll have a, a good inroad and it will, have, it will be well attended. And normally we have about 25, 30 people that walk in. One year we had about 50 people, which was awesome. That was a, quite a few years ago, but I think we could still maybe have numbers close to that. Our VBS, again, Pray for VBS. Pray for your involvement. If you're not going to be involved in it, just pray for it. Pray that God will give us the right workers. Now, here's a neat blessing. So, Pensacola Christian College normally calls me and asks if they could have a summer ensemble group come and represent the college and be a blessing to our church. They wanted to come on a Tuesday night. That was the only date that they had open. That's a Tuesday. That's... They're like, well, maybe you could do a, a special service on Tuesday. Like, you know, I think it would probably be better if you came at a different time. Do you have anything open? And they kind of moved their schedule around for us. They said, well, how about this? What if the guys came and were with you both services on July 17th? Would that work? And I said, sure, that would work. So they're going to bring five guys that sing and the director <coughs> of the group with his wife. And they're going to do the entire music for our Vacation Bible School open night. They're going to sing in the morning, get everybody excited about VBS, be a part of our worship service. And then that night, they would like to help out in any way they can for the opening night for VBS, which is exciting. So that's what we're going to be doing. Remember, VBS this year, that date is not a mistake. The first night of VBS is on a Sunday night. And so that's, we're not, we're not canceling the evening service. We're including everyone to be part of this. I know it's a little unorthodox, but it is something that I think will be a blessing. So many of you are already involved in VBS. So we're still going to have our service at 6, except you guys are going to be participating in that. So that's not a night to stay home. That's a night to be part of the service and see what's going on. So whether you help out with the refreshments or craft time or game time, or perhaps you want to assist one of the teachers that we have, um, your involvement with that would be would be gratefully appreciated. But it just kind of works out that the Pensacola group will be here to sing and they'll do some skits and do some stuff to help out our group. I said, oh, that would be awesome. So it's 17th, so it would be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, nothing Friday. That's usually our day to recover. Because normally what we do is we go Monday through Friday, Saturday's family fun night, and we are just totally exhausted the next day. So put a little gap day, then we have Saturday family fun day, um, and then we'll, you know, obviously have our service like normal on uh, whatever date that would be three days later, okay? So, um, pray about that, okay? The final thing before we get into our Bible study tonight is the first responders cookout. I did stop by the police station today in Litchfield, and I did speak with the person who's in charge of organizing their events. I said, I, I wanted to introduce myself again. I think we talked last year about being involved in our um, First Responders Sunday. He goes, oh yeah, yeah, sorry we weren't able to go, we just kind of a lot of things going on. 
I said, well, we're going to change up some things this year. We want to do it on a Saturday. We want to make it a cookout. And we want to know if you guys would be willing to challenge the firefighters in a cornhole tournament. What do you think? Because they're telling me that they could wipe you guys. So I didn't say that. But uh, maybe I will. So that is, so that's kind of how we're going to pit it, you know, against, you know, we'll have the firefighters, whoever shows up, whatever firefighters from whatever town, versus the police officers from whatever town, probably Litchfield mainly, um, and we'll do everything out on the field. So pray about being involved in that. Steve's going to kind of coordinate that, especially the food part, and I, I will work with him on some of the other things, but we want to make sure that people know about it. Last year, it landed on September 11th, so we were kind of weren't sure if it was going to work or not, and so we did have two firefighters who showed up, and that was a blessing, um, but I think by doing it on a Saturday, it might allow more people to attend, and uh, we will certainly preach the gospel and uh, use it as outreach, but it will also be a time just to kind of Enjoy each other's company and, and make some, you know, make some connections with some of these people. Okay, so that's something to pray about. I know it doesn't seem like it's that close. Where here we are in the middle of April, but it'll be here before you know it. And so we're praying about this event and God will open doors. Anybody have a question or thought about anything that was mentioned? Okay, Memorial Day parade on the 30th, VBS in July. That's in, not too far after VBS. A lot of exciting things. Yes, Brother Steve. I just want to make clear, I am going to be asking the church for help as far as the food part. I'm going to be taking care of the meat that we're going to be serving. And then I get on to the uh, Butcher Brothers, right down on the Old Road. I'll buy all the meats. Uh, I mean, they have fantastic meats. They have no different kind of marinades. Yeah. I'm going to, just out of pocket, I'm going to pay for all the meats. But I'm going to ask for some of the ladies to make some of their special potato salads. <laughs> and uh, other items, yeah, for audiences. Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll be coordinating a lot right. uh, more when it comes closer. But I'm just getting it out there that I, I'm going to need some help. Absolutely, so, right. Yes, and so there will be games that we'll be doing out on the field and just, you know, kind of like Family Fun Day a little bit, but we'll have some, just some times to socialize a little bit. But... And, and again, the inhibition of coming to a church service sometimes keeps people from, you know, they're nervous about what to expect coming to a service. Sometimes you do an event like this, it kind of breaks that ice a little bit, and uh, we're, we're able to make those connections. And also show our appreciation, ultimately, for those who are serving our community. It also will include EMT, so people who work in that department as well, okay? All right, let's take our Bibles tonight and open them up to the book of Jude as we continue our study. I want to do a quick recap um, before we really get into it, um, and, and hopefully this will be um, helpful moving forward. Remember, at the beginning of this study, we looked at uh, Jude's greeting and how he addresses others and certainly how he refers to himself. Then he talks a little bit about the purpose of his writing, God's judgment in times past. But then, remember, it seemed like it took us forever to get through this. And, and not that it was a bad thing. I'm not saying it that way. But just it was, Jude is very serious about warning us concerning false teachers. And so from verse 8 to verse 19, there's, there's only, what, 25 uh, verses in the entire letter. But so the character... The characteristics of false teachers is a good portion of this letter. And so he uses some different examples, people from history, biblical history, as well as uh, pointing out natural examples and so forth. And then uh, what we're going to be looking at tonight are the exhortation to build our faith and then the farewell blessing. Okay, so we're just going to be looking at verses 20 through 23 tonight. I'm not sure exactly how far we're going to get tonight. I don't want to rush through this because what we're going to be talking about are important things. Um, and after, next week, uh, we'll be getting back from our trip to Pennsylvania. We'll be a little exhausted, so we'll see. If we do a two-parter, I will already have a lesson ready for next week. So that's how it goes. All right, is everyone in the book of Jude? Okay, let's read verse 20 down to verse 23, and then we'll look at what Paul, or excuse me, what Jude is talking about. Okay, verse 20. He says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, 
making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Everyone have the handouts tonight. We're going to be noticing the edification techniques of maturing believers. What does it mean to edify? What does that mean? Nancy. To build up, yes. What else? To encourage. Validate. Validate. To validate, sure. It is the equipping of one to prepare for their task or their encounter, their journey. And so I'm, I've entitled this lesson The Edification Techniques of Maturing Believers because here Jude spent a good majority of this book, his letter, his personal letter, warning about false teachers and what to look for. Now he's speaking specifically to the church. Notice again back in verse 20, he says, But ye beloved, that is a term of endearment, but it is specific to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking to them personally. He loves them, but more than him, He's saying, God loves you, Christ loves you, he died for you, he cares about you, and then gives four ways or techniques of how we are to mature ourselves. So edification is the process, spiritually speaking, of building up ourselves so that we can be more like our Savior. And by the way, that never stops, regardless of how many years you've been saved or how mature you are in the Lord. That is a constant journey. It's a constant process. If I use the word technique, I didn't really know what other word I could use here. I, it's just the principles or practices of believers and how we build ourselves up. I remember, it's, it's hard to believe it's been this long, but it was back in the uh, summer of 2017, we added a very large addition to our house, 1,500 square foot addition. And uh, we had, before that, we had a lot of people saying, oh, now that Daniel and Josh are older teenage boys, what are you going to do for room? And our answer was, we don't know. We really are. We were, we were kind of crowded with seven boys. And, of course, Andrew and Micah were much smaller, younger. And so we prayed about it. And then God just opened some doors and gave us opportunity. And we started praying about adding to our house. And I remember we were talking to David Melody about this. And we were talking to my mom and dad. And it was just kind of came up where my mom and dad said, well, hey, what if we moved in with you? And it was just so weird to think about them selling their house and adding on with us and how that would work and how big of a house we would make it and so forth. And um, even today, it still feels weird when I drive by and I see the Caravulises there. I'm glad that they own the house, but it's just, you know, that was the house that they lived in for so many years and I was raised there. But I remember the process of, okay, here we go. We met with our contractor, laid out all the plans, all the architectural designs. This is for real. I remember he was very personable, very outgoing. He sat down with us and he said, now I'm excited. You guys are excited. Do you have the money to do this? <laughs> and I said, I think so. Um, and certainly we did. But it was just one of those things where putting everything together was so new. And I don't know if you've ever built a house before, but that is kind of an interesting process of all the things that you have to choose and the different things that are involved in that. Anyways, I don't want to bore you with all the details because many of you know this, but it was neat how they started with the foundation and then just kind of framed it out. And every day I would come home after being here for most of the day or wherever, and you'd come home and there was progress and it was just slowly over time, it was what it was. And I remember it was at the point where our contractor said, hey, let's go in and check it out. So we're walking around in it. We're kind of envisioning where everything was gonna, is going to be. Then the windows were put in. And then we had people over. Hey, does, you guys want to come over and see our windows? This is exciting. Walking around, we had to take a ladder in to get into the, because the way from our existing house to the addition wasn't really made yet. So we had to climb through a ladder and we're walking around. This is the bedroom. This is the bathroom. This is going to be the living room and all these things. And so when we think about edifying or building up, it is actually a term that's connected with the word house. It's this idea that you are making something better. And uh, so there's a number of, of applications to this. But so as we look specifically in verses 20 and 21, I want to give you four thoughts tonight concerning what I believe Jude is teaching us to do. So these are exhortations. Um, and so the first one is that we are to be faith builders. Now, again, 
Once we're saved, once God saves us and we are in his hands and we are redeemed, um, there, is, there is the constant dependence upon the Lord and God has called us to walk by faith. The just shall live by faith, the Bible tells us. And so we don't create faith in the sense that we're not saved um, by ourselves. It is a work of God. It's a work of us believing and God is convicting us, convincing us through his spirit, through the word, and then we believe. So when we talk about, and I was even, you know, battling with this phrase about faith building, and I'm basing it on what he says in verse 20, because Jude says, but ye beloved Christian church, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Do You see that phrase in verse 20? So what does that mean? How do we build ourselves up on our most holy faith? Anybody have any thoughts before we we tackle this tonight? Because we're going to be looking maybe at three more. We'll see. At least two. Anybody? Yes, Ron? Studying God's Word. Say it one more time. Studying God's Word. Studying God's Word. Okay, absolutely. Yes, Steve? Oh, for me, anyway, it's been that you go through and where you can see that you can trust in the Lord even when it seems uh, not really hopeless but when you're in dire need of something or whether it's uh, your job is being threatened or physical ailments whatever each time you go through with God I think that builds you up because it shows how much you can trust in Him when you can't trust in your own Sure. So a greater dependence upon the Lord through difficulties, trials, or whatever it may be, getting into God's word. The word faith here is the same word that is used in Ephesians chapter 4, and that there is one faith, one hope, one baptism, one God. Um, And so this faith is talking about our relationship with God, our, we might even say our faith system, what we believe in. And so he's saying we build up upon it. Now, some thoughts here. First of all, the call to build up our faith is based upon the hope that believers in Christ understand, first and foremost, the proper foundation upon which we are to build our faith. So it has to start with the foundation. That's kind of why I was talking a little bit about the addition that was built for our house back in 2017. The foundation was poured. And that's usually the part of the house that remains long after Other parts of the house kind of disintegrate or fall apart. Usually you see a house and you see the foundation and it's kind of dilapidated, but the foundation usually is still there most of the time, right? And so back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talks about this foundation. Let's hold our place in Jude and go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because Paul is talking about his calling, his ministry, what Jesus had called Paul to do, and he was saying, when I ministered to you, I had a job, and he says in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 3, he says, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, so that grace is God's enabling strength to to do what he was called to do, he says, as a wise master builder, we might say contractor, or as the architect, he said, I have laid the foundation. Now, he's not the foundation. Paul wasn't saying he was the foundation, but what does it mean for Paul to say he laid the foundation? What do you think he's talking about there? Anyone? Okay, Dave? Right. The foundation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the, it had been laid. So he goes, it, I laid it in the sense that I presented it. Another buildeth thereon. That could have been Apollos, who was the pastor of the church, or other preachers that came through. But then he says, but let every man take heed how he what? How he what, church? How he buildeth thereupon, right? So he's saying, how you build up the church, how you, we can also make that personally, how we build ourselves up in our faith. That's what Jude is telling us to do. So then he says in verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is who? Jesus Christ. That's the foundation for living. Let's go back to Jude, because what we notice here very carefully is that Jesus is the foundation. So the question is, is he the foundation of your life? He has to be in order for you to be a true believer. 
It's based upon your own good deeds or your own works or your own righteousness. That is a faulty foundation. Um, look at this verse in Ephesians 2.20, a, a similar concept or doctrine being taught here by Paul to the Ephesian church when he says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, talking about their message, what they preached, everything centered upon the gospel. And then it says, Jesus Christ himself being what? The chief cornerstone of the foundation, right? So that's the stumbling block that was discarded by those who do not see Christ as the Messiah, but he is the foundation. So he's the foundation of this church. He's the foundation of us as believers. And so we speak of Jesus Christ being vital. He is the eternal son of God. We worship God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And upon the gospel message is our faith founded. Okay? So I think we all, we all know that, right? So here's another thought. So then how do we build up our faith? Again, verse 20, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Here's another thought. The call to build up our faith also includes the plan to not remain a child, but rather to mature in Christ in all things. So how does that happen? How do we grow in the Lord? Does that naturally happen just because you've been saved for X amount of years? How do we grow in the Lord? I think we could probably answer it the same way that we were talking about edification. Studying God's word, learning to be faithful, to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit, to be fed, to desire to study God's word, but to have a real relationship with God and to see God for who he is and that he desires to guide us and direct us. And sometimes that may be through difficult seasons of life. But it's interesting, I put up there, not to remain a child, but rather to mature in Christ in all things. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I'll show you an interesting verse. It's a cross-reference to this uh, teaching concerning how we grow in the Lord. We oftentimes use this verse as a way of explaining to others, and this, we do this with our children, and there's nothing wrong with this, but it's not necessarily the direct interpretation of this verse. We tell our kids to be kind in how they speak to one another, right? And I think there's many other verses that we could use besides Ephesians 4, uh, 15. And, and we should. Our, our children, you know, should be kind in how they speak to one another. And certainly that's going to carry over in how they speak to their friends or classmates or fellow teammates or, you know, other interactions that they have. So the Apostle Paul back in Ephesians chapter 4 is talking about, verse 14, not being children, okay, spiritually speaking. A child can't help being a child. We have to always remember that. And that's why, does it bother me when Chris was having a little bit of a tantrum? I wasn't sure what was going on. And you, ha you were hugging him, and he went, finally was able to kind of cool down or whatever. <laughs> was he okay? <laughs> He's coming to the altar. But you know what? And we just say, sometimes Chris, it's, things can be, you know, he's just having a hard time or whatever. Kids sometimes have hard days, just like you have hard days. And so the point is, is that Paul uses a child as an example of someone who's still learning, still growing. And perhaps it's, we tend to, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I'm sure I'm not alone in this, that we tend to think it's only a doctrinal thing. Like this is, well, they're still learning doctrine. Well, sometimes as a Christian, it, regardless of how old you are physically, your spiritual maturity might be connected to not just your understanding of what the Bible teaches, but how you're responding to life, how you're dealing with trials, how you're dealing with things that happen. I still get very agitated over things that my wife reminds me of that I need more patience or whatever. It's like, I don't want more patience. I just want to bop people. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but look what it says in verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Then he says, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man or mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. And again, he's talking about spiritual children in our spiritual maturity, tossed to and fro. And notice what he's saying that they do. Carried about with every wind of what? Doctrine. Being led astray this way and led astray that way. And so, yes, it certainly does matter doctrinally. And so sometimes we'll have people that will come here visiting our church, asking what we believe. 
And so we just believe the Bible. We just interpret the Bible literally, and here's what we believe. You can find out more about us on our website. Here's our, a copy of our statement of faith. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. We don't have some weird uh, other teachings that are out there that are, you know, extra biblical teachings. At least I don't think we do. Um, but notice how, how they're, they're carried about. It says, by the slight of men. You see that? That's talking about false teachers. Because they're not grounded in their faith yet, because they haven't really built up their faith, they get easily knocked over. So this is the straw and the stick house rather than the brick house. If we're going to use the three little pigs analogy, okay? And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, and cunning craftiness whereby they, talk about false teachers, lie in wait to do what? Last word in verse 14, to do what? To deceive. So it's intentional. So God doesn't want you to be deceived. God doesn't want you to be believing something that the Bible doesn't teach. He wants you to grow in your faith. So not only do we understand it doctrinally, but we understand it experientially. We see the goodness of God revealed to us. We see and we've experienced the peace of God when we're going through trials. We know that God is with us even when things seem chaotic and crazy and even when our, our world can't define what a man is and what a woman is and all these other lunatic policies that our politicians are putting in place, defending the perversions and, and all these other things. We have to say, God's still in control. This is not my permanent home. So then we get to verse 15 and notice what Paul says. But speaking the truth in love, Okay, so again, we tend to use that to say, now speak the truth in love, be kind in how you say it, and that's true, but this verse is saying, speak the truth from God's word and do it in a loving way so that the receiver of your instruction, your students, whether they're your children, your grandchildren, people you're discipling, people in your small group, people in your church, whoever they may be, they may do what? Notice the end of verse 15, they may grow up into him in all things, and then it says, which is the head, even Christ. So grow up into what? To be more like Christ. That's edification. And that's how we do that, by building up our own faith. But we help people along the way. So I want to help Joshua, my son, to be a man of God, to understand what it means to be a godly husband and a godly father. But I'm not going to just point him to myself, because I have a lot of faults, and he probably knows more about them than anybody else in this room. He's very good at keeping uh, in the family here, right? <laughs> but also that Joshua could say, well, he is, yes, to, to emulate his dad in some ways, I guess, but also, more importantly, to be like Christ. And that's what Paul is saying here. Okay? And then he talks about how the whole body is fitly joined together, compacted by every joint that supplieth. That's how we grow up. That's how we are strengthened. That's how we build ourselves up. So, yes, we can talk about edification from a housing perspective, but it also kind of means like building up muscles, getting stronger, growing. When you think about your children being, you know, so small and tiny they can't do anything, before you know it, Desmond will be playing soccer on the, uh, on the soccer team here for Tabernacle. You go, come on, Desmond, let's go. And he's going to be zipping around the field scoring goals, and he's going to be in junior high before you know it. All right, I have this as a handout. If anyone wants a copy of this, I know if you're watching at home, you may not be able to see all the, the really small font, but we've talked about this before <laughs> growing up in the Lord. This, to me, is a perfect example. I think for me, spiritually, this was really my journey of faith. I've only known God's word. I was asked this question by a student many years ago, do I think I would still be a Christian if I wasn't, if I wasn't immersed in it like I was? I, I can't answer that question. I would hope I would be, but, you know, the point is, is that that's what the blessing I've had. I grew up in a godly home. I grew up in this church. I went to this school and then had the blessing of going off to Bible college and preparing for the ministry. So when I was a young boy, and think about where you were at, wherever, whenever you became saved. For Brother Ed and Carol, it was later on in life, right? You know, middle age, rather than, you know, being a, a child physically. So, so wherever you were when you began your journey of faith, everyone starts off as an infant. And what, what do they do? Is they, they're in Christ, but there's lacking discernment or, or understanding. That's why when someone gets saved right away, they need to be discipled. And so they are often at that sharing stage, which I love being around uh, a young child, or, I mean a young uh, Christian. They're like a young child where they want to show you everything. I remember when our, our boys were little, like, look, Daddy. I'm like, yes, that's a Cheerio. Okay, all right, thank you. I'll eat that. Another Cheerio. Thank you, Josh. 
all right? And it's just like everything's new. They want to share. They want to talk about their faith. They want to talk about what's exciting. Hey, have you ever read this cool book called Psalms? What an awesome book. Have you ever read it before? Yep, a few times. Yeah, that's great. Tell me all about it. And I was, there's, there's like 150 of them. I just kept going. It was like, it was like you know, I took me all night. I said, awesome. And we just kind of like, yeah, I've read it like 100 times. There's a joy and a zeal and a passion because they're ready to share. But oftentimes, they're still learning, and so they can be easily influenced to go in the wrong direction if they're not grounded. Then we get to connect where a child is growing in Christ, but they're still very self-centered. And so if you're a child spiritually where some people stay stunted, everything is about them. Oh, I went to this church, but like the music there, or this church was so, you know, like the color of the pews, and so it's very, everything's so... They can't get past the surface stuff. And so they may know the Bible, but then they become very picky, like a child. is like, I don't want those green beans, even though they're healthy for me. I want to have chocolate cake for dinner. And so this is where people struggle. But yet at the same time, if they continue to grow and they're being encouraged to mature, you don't, you don't want to keep a child, uh, spiritually speaking, in that stage. If they're never going to move forward. And sadly, there are a lot of adults who may have been saved for a long period of time. They never move out of that stage. And that is tragic for a church because a church will never move to the place where God wants them to grow if everybody stays at that level. So they'll connect, but it oftentimes that's the socialite Christian who likes to fellowship, which basically means they just like to do Christian stuff with other Christians, but they don't really ever want to reach out. They don't want to disciple others. They don't want to you know, do the work of the Lord, which is far more than just your holy huddles. So it leads to the minister, someone who's a young adult, Christ-centered, other-focused. That was, that's Timothy. That's Titus. The young men that understand their calling, young women who understand their calling to serve, to be involved. Pastor Miller took me under his wing when I said I wanted to go into the ministry, and he had me helping out with the teen ministry. and helped me. I was doing junior church, and I was helping out with the the uh, children's ministry program, and he was giving me opportunities to do different things as a 19-year-old, 20-year-old. I didn't know hardly anything about the ministry other than I just wanted to serve the Lord, and he helped me with my sermons, and he helped me other things. And of course, Bible college helped me a lot as well. But the point is, is that you take somebody like that who's a spiritual young adult, and Paul calls them young men in First John, or excuse me, John calls them a young men in First John. Passion, ready to go out, but there's still a lack of wisdom because they haven't really experienced a whole lot yet. So they're other-focused, they're Christ-centered, they're growing, but again, the final stage is someone who's parenting, who has Christ-like intentions, they're a disciple-maker, that's Paul. And you're looking to invest your life in someone else. You're able to, to do the work of the ministry, and these are the men and women that God is calling to serve and to have people like that, which our church has been blessed to have many people like that, that, that's how the church grows, all right? That's it in a nutshell. Anybody have any thoughts or comments about that? All right, are we in, let's go back to Jude. So faith building, that's number one. What time is it? Okay, I think we're just going to do two tonight, and then I'll, oh, praise the Lord. I'll have two more points next week, and to worry about a lesson, because I think I'm going to be tired, and I may just take Wednesday off after this trip. Do you blame me, or should I come into work on, on Wednesday? After spending 48 hours with a bunch of teenagers, you're like, Take the rest of the week off, Pastor Small. Okay, I might do that. All right, number two. <laughs> number two is prayer warriors. Prayer warriors. All right. These are all topics in a sense that I could probably spend an entire lesson on if I really wanted to. We go back to Jude. He says, build up yourselves on your most holy faith. Continue to grow in the Lord. Be edified. And then he says, praying in the Holy Ghost. Why that phrase? Well, Jude would probably tell you if he was here right now that God told him to write that, so we'll just go with that. But also, why is that phrase important? Is that a biblical phrase? I mean, outside of Jude. It is, and I'll show you a couple of verses. So if you're taking notes tonight, the call to pray in the Holy Ghost is both a common and needful reminder to all believers in Christ. Those two verses that are up there for you to cross-reference whenever you want to um, are verses that just remind us to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is one of those verses we call those emphatic imperatives and everyone's favorite memory verse when you're a little kid. Pray without ceasing, right? <laughs> 
But really, it's powerful when you think about it. Continue to pray. And by the way, that's not a call for one person to pray and not do anything else. That's for the church to continually pray. Pray for one another. Pray for one another. Continue to pray for one another. Our enemy, Satan, wants us to think about this, that praying doesn't really matter. And that could be the farthest thing from the truth. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to show you a verse up on the screen, but I want to give you the context of this. Again, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's all we're going to do tonight. The other two points we'll get to, Lord willing, next week. All right? 1 Timothy 2, 1 also just talks about praying for one another in a constant state of prayer. Now watch this. Just as our preaching, our teaching, evangelizing, and worshiping, and really anything else that you want to add there that we might say is, is the work of the ministry of the Lord, requires God's power. Effective prayer, effective prayer, involves a dependence upon the Holy Spirit. So we're praying to God in and through the power of the Spirit, and we're doing it and invoking the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we pray to God, our Heavenly Father, and we say, in the name of Jesus, when we pray. He's the mediator. Um, okay, so Ephesians chapter 6. Is everyone there? Now, what is Ephesians 6 talking about? Eventually, when we start meeting again normally for our evening services, we will resume our study through Ephesians, and we're kind of sort of started off in the armor of God. So at the end of Paul listing all of the different pieces of the armor of God, Paul says this in verse 18. Okay, and actually, I think I may even have the verse up here. Okay, maybe not. It's up there. Eventually, it will come back to us. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, envision verse 18. Um, I really need that to come back up because I have a very important quote that I want you to read. By. Okay, all right, very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication, which, by the way, what is supplication? What's a good way of defining supplication? How is it different than prayer? Requests? Yeah. Pleading. Yeah. Supplication is like, is like begging God. So there's something that is it's distinguished from prayer, but I think it is very much part of our prayer life. So when we're praying, we're, we're pleading with God, we're begging God. Now, notice what he says at the end of verse 18. He, well, not the end, but the rest of this phrase. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And the, the Spirit, the word, the Greek word there, is, does not indicate whether it's the Holy Spirit or, or Spirit. It's often in context. And it's capitalized in our Bibles properly, I believe, because it's talking about how we pray not in our spirit, but in the Holy Spirit. And doesn't that complement the verse that we just read in Jude that tells us that we should pray in the Holy Ghost? Can somebody tell me then what does that mean to pray in the Spirit? Brother Ed? The insistence in prayer, is that what you said? Okay. All right, sure. Insistence in prayer? Roger? Trying to get, find God's face? Sure. So when we're preaching, or when we're evangelizing, or when we're worshiping, or doing anything else, and the Bible tells us to do it in the Spirit, be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. We're saying, Spirit, empower me to do that. So are we praying in the Spirit? It's the Spirit empowering you as you pray. When you get serious about praying for more than just a couple of minutes before you eat or whatever it is that you have your prayer time, if you say, I'm going to pray, then you'll find some natural resistance from yourself, but also you'll find some other forms of resistance. How many have ever seen the movie War Room? It's one of the Kendrick... Oh, good. I'm so that delights me. If you've not seen that movie, please, if you're watching online right now or, or in the auditorium, Rent that movie, worth every penny. I'll lend you my copy of it on Blu-ray. It is excellent. It is really, really good. And what's hilarious about it is that when she starts off, to the, the main character, when she's challenged by an older, more mature woman in the faith, in the Christian faith, to, to pray, to get a prayer closet and pray, and that's what the war room is, 
that she does that and she just struggles with, you know, she has a bag of potato chips, she's drinking some soda, she's twirling around in her chair. She doesn't know what to do when she gets into her prayer room. And by the end of the movie, she's a changed woman. It's a fantastic movie. And there's other aspects of the movie that make it appealing for believers. But that's the main point of it. And so I believe that Paul, as well as Jude, as well as James even, when we're talking about praying with intensity, seeking God's face, whatever, however you want to describe it, it's we're invoking God's strength to do something that's important. So we're praying to God by his strength. As compared to prayer, that doesn't seem to get past the ceiling. Okay? All right. Anybody else want to add to that thought about praying in the spirit? John Bunyan. Oh, yes, go ahead. Okay, sure. It's the right state of mind. It's the right empowerment to do it. It's a ministry that matters. You know, God has called us to pray. It's not just, you know, listing all the things that we want. We're, 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 we're praying for others. There's different aspects of it. Uh, James says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, so we need to pray. We need to make sure we have a right standing with God as we pray. Um, Dave, did you have your hand? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, Romans tells us to walk in the Spirit, which means live in the Spirit. So if you're living in the Spirit, you're going to pray in the Spirit. Very good. I agree with that. Sure. But is it possible? Um... Sorry. <laughs> That's me. Decker is doing something. Um, the, I thought it was somebody's phone there for a minute. All right. <laughs> Oh, it's your meltdown. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Like, no, it's okay. That's fine. All right. As long as nothing's going to explode right now. Like, like, I'm hearing a noise. Okay. Yes. Hey, that's a great invention. Um, so here's the thing. When we're talking about being in the spirit and walking in the spirit, our prayer life is very much connected to desire, a heart position, and what we're trying to do. A while ago, I'm going to say maybe a year or two ago, I did a series on prayer, and we talked about praying in the Spirit. We talked about fervent prayer. This is a quote from John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress. He's a great Baptist preacher in the 1600s. He said this, Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the heart to God through Christ. And then he, and again, I'm only putting this up because I think it's a biblical statement. I mean, you know, just because someone put this up here doesn't mean it's the same as the Bible, but I think it's a biblical quote. It's in the strength and assistance of who? Of who church? Of the Holy Spirit. All right? So that's kind of how I see it. I see it that way, and, and I think John Bunyan sees it the same way, and I think we're just agreeing with the Bible by saying that when we pray, um, and we, we are, again, let's just go back to Jude. When we're praying in the Spirit, we're doing so in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, and that is the biblical way of doing it. Okay, so we're praying in the Holy Ghost. I suppose we could go and talk a little bit more about uh, other aspects of prayer, and, and I don't think that's really what I'm going to do right now, unless somebody else wants to add to it, but I basically see that phrase at the end of verse 20 is just exhorting us to pray in a using the technique or the, uh, the, the method or the way, the spiritual discipline, maybe that's a better word, um, of, of the right way. Okay? And so that's it. Okay? So that's all I have for tonight. So we'll, we'll stop there. And, um, oops, oops, Steve. Yeah, why don't we just close that? Sorry, I went a little bit too far. Um, let me just turn the projector off. The, we'll take some prayer requests right now. Does anybody have a thought or comment about anything? That was discussed concerning those two things. Yeah, Steve. Well, what, what helps me not be, I guess, flippant about going to God. Um, you know, like Melody said, you know, you don't want to just do it because you think you have to or it's what you're supposed to do. But what helps me revere him. just that I'm talking to a distant being that's way beyond our reach, or that I'm trying to reach up to him, because so many religions in the world try to reach up to God, when he's actually reached down to us through his son. So I try to picture either him or Christ standing right in front of me when I'm praying, and then I get a lot more heartfelt about my prayer, 
that's a great perspective. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes, Melody. I think that even though I said, you know, you pray in spirit, I, I feel like even if you don't feel that connection, you still need to do it. Sure. It, it's, a, it, it's like reading the Bible. You don't, you don't feel like you're getting anything out of it, but you need to do it for, number one, for habit, and also you might get something out of it you don't go really realize. You need to keep on with your good habits, even if you don't feel like they're getting anywhere. Okay, good. It's a good reminder. Sure. All right, yes, Charlene, and then Brother Ed. I hear what you're saying. Well, I was, I remember I was reminded of this that oftentimes what we pour out to God is usually what's on our heart. And so if there's things that are on your heart that deal with you personally or your family, those things need to go to the Lord. So I wouldn't worry about the false sense of guilt. I would just pour it out to God. And then just really, right, absolutely he does. But I think sometimes you can feel guilty that maybe your prayer is more, the prayer time is more centered about yourself than it is on others. And then you feel like maybe you shouldn't give those prayers. I think you should still pray that way. But that's why we have a prayer meeting. And it's interesting. When I talk to some of my pastor friends, I go, how much time is spent in your prayer meeting praying? And it's interesting where some churches are used the midweek prayer meeting as just like a, another service. And I'm like, so you're not praying at your prayer meeting? Well, we don't really call it a prayer meeting. I'm like, well, you shouldn't if you're not praying. I mean, so when we take prayer requests, and whether you're not able to be with us in person, you're watching at home, or you're here right now, um, we plan to pray. That's what we should be doing. And uh, sometimes my lessons go a little bit longer than I anticipate, but I really try to be done at a certain time so that we can give ourselves to this. And that you don't use this as the only time you're praying, but we should pray together as a church and then individually with, you, with your children or whomever, your family. Pour out your heart to God, no matter what. But I think oftentimes, yeah, you might feel bad that you have so much stuff going on, but that's, you're, you're the one that you know the best. So you know what's going on in your life, right? All right, Steve? Yeah, I, I think it actually pleases God when we come to him. But yeah, I agree. Amen. And God does tell us to pray for all things. So we are called to do that. So we, and we know that. We know that we're supposed to pray for others. So it certainly involves, uh, even for people that, you know, that we may have a hard time getting along with. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So there's some other people that we need to pray for. <laughs> Well, let me tell you their names, Pastor Small. <laughs> Keep that between you and I. Yes, Brother Ed. Yeah, I think that's a good 
Yes, Brother Ed. I believe that prayer, pray without ceasing, and then in verse 18, pray always with all prayer and supplication. It's telling us to persevere. Yeah. Don't give up. When, like I said, when you pray, like I think of an example of that was us praying 40 years for my father. If we didn't give up on that, yeah, exactly. then it would have happened. But again, God doesn't always say no. Sometimes we, we didn't, we're not having our prayers answered immediately. We, we don't persevere, we just stop it. We don't pray it. Right. And I think that perseverance is an important part of it. Amen. Yeah, we're asking according to the will of God. We're praying persistently. What's the parable? Is it the widow who came to the unjust judge? Mm -hmm. Just continued to beg and beg and beg. So, yeah. Good thoughts. And again, you know, obviously talk, talking about something like prayer just for 15 minutes is hard because we could probably spend another hour or two talking about prayer, what the Bible has to say about it. But uh, it's important that we pray. It's important that we give everything over to God. And... Uh, Certainly, most of that may involve us directly, um, but hopefully as you think about others in your life and your church family and, and other people that you, that you care about, that list grows, and then you have that, that list that you can keep adding to. All right, anybody else have a thought before we take some prayer requests? Okay, good, good thoughts. So, Lord willing, next Wednesday, plan is for us to continue uh, with those those next two uh, main points about um, how we build ourselves up in our faith in the sense of the edification techniques of the maturing believer. Okay, I already gave a few prayer requests. Let me just remind you about those. Are the Withens in Mexico as they're serving the Lord. Just continue to pray for them as they are in Mexico City and it's a very large city. It's like almost really like being in New York. Um, so just pray for their, their neighborhood and that they're trying to reach for the Lord, big area. Pray for our trip on Monday with our teens, that we would just have a wonderful time connecting with them, having a good time. I'm really looking forward to the play. Um, just pray that everyone is okay. We have one of our teens right now who is not 100% health-wise. We're just praying that she's okay before we go on that trip. We would hate for her not to be able to go on the trip because of sickness. Um, so financially, we're doing good. We had somebody on Sunday came and gave a pretty nice donation towards the trip, so we we're good to go. Um, any other future donations that you'd like to give towards the team ministry can be used for the Wilds of New England summer camp, and the teams are planning on going on that uh, probably end of July, early August. Okay? Um, so let's take some prayer requests tonight. Just raise your hand, let me know. So, okay, ready? Prayer requests tonight. Yes, Brother Ed? How's the staff for next year? So coming together, yeah, we, we, you know, we're meeting with uh, some, and we've, uh, we have some leads on some teachers. So just, yeah, just continue to pray for our school staff and uh, some people who are praying about next year and how they can be involved in our school. And uh, so we haven't heard anybody outside of people that we kind of already know in a sense that uh, we haven't had any like recent graduates from some of the colleges that, that we would feel comfortable hiring from. Uh, but, but again, we're just praying that the Lord will direct people in that way. So yeah, that's a very important need. Soon, yeah, soon. Yeah, our, by faith we're going to have a school next year, which is what it will look like. Um, but we believe that God will bring the right people. But yeah, we'll keep, we'll keep them real close. Probably when we get back from our trip, we're hoping to have some finalized answers from some uh, I bet. Yes, Brother Roger? Uh, Gordon's uh, healing. Okay, Gordon. He has a trip coming up that uh, he needs to be healed well enough. He's still going to help, but he needs to. Okay, so Gordon Wellman was healing with his shoulder surgery and even some, he had some uh, issues with his wrist as well. So it doesn't seem to be quite that as much pain as he was before, but still it's hurting, and I'm sure he's a little bit uncomfortable on that trip. Brother Steve. I just pray for that people in Ukraine. Yes, absolutely. Ukraine. Yes. Uh, Dante still doesn't have a normal sleep schedule, which means Heidi hasn't been working 
since December. I mean, she comes in and helps at the school, but I mean, three hours a day doesn't exactly help pay the bills. So, just struggling a little bit on that. Okay. So, his sleep and our finances. All right. Dante, a sleep schedule and financial needs of the McCall's. Yes, Roger? Okay. Jerry and Mary are, are they going up to Canada or are they just, they will be coming back. Okay. <clears throat> As they travel back from Nova Scotia, I would assume, or? Let's be in prayer for some of those events that I just recently, those specific events that I mentioned a little bit ago concerning our outreach with the town of Litchfield for the Memorial Day Parade, for the Vacation Bible School, and for our first responders cookout. Um, just everything would come together with that, and we just had good days for those events, and that it would be well attended. And again, that you would pray about your part in being involved in that. Yes, Darlene. That's a great idea. I, I didn't really think about doing that. Um, it's usually through the fire department that the EMTs are notified, but yeah, I suppose I could do that. Um, let's not invite the whole hospital vote. <laughs> <laughs> I can only cook. I can only cook so much meat. One can always day. run down to McDonald's. Come on, nobody. <laughs> Everybody like chicken nuggets here. Just the food. EMT booth, not the nurses, doctors. <laughs> Uh, but you're talking about candy getting EMTs that would be at the hospital. Yeah, yeah, okay. right. yeah I, I guess I had never really thought about that, but that's a great idea. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be a letter going out and um, inviting them to be part of it. And we have to build up this firefighter, police officer, cornhole challenge. We've got to get that. Oh, maybe bring some other people. I have a question on that. Yes. On the uh, cornhole boards themselves. How many do you have or plan to have, or should we reach out to, I know a couple of our neighbors have some I can ask, or we can Sure, yeah, yeah, day. we can definitely talk about that. Uh, I, I think we we'll probably grab some, I, I have a set, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. we'll probably need, if we have a good turnout, we'll probably need three or four. Sets, oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, if you have a, a set that you'd like to let us borrow, that's a good shape, sure. All right, yes, Georgia? Joanne, she did not get the apartment we looked at. She's got till the end of this month. Okay. Find something or she's going to be out on the street literally. Okay, Joanne Pierce's apartment hunting that you find a place that would be suitable for her needs and soon. <coughs> Hi, Brother Ron, do you have a prayer? Uh, no, I was just going to say I have said it. Oh, okay, you have some more. Okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. We'll work out the details for sure. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, and his name again? Jadane. Jadane. Other prayer requests tonight. Again, travel mercies for our group that heads down to Pennsylvania. Just with the end of school year as a whole, just with our teachers and our staff and our students. And um, we have tomorrow night, we have our sports awards night. I pray that that will be a blessing. And uh, some of the kids I haven't seen for a little bit, some of our homeschool families, so that should be a blessed time. Any other prayer requests tonight? Okay. All right, for those of you that are watching at home, we'll say goodbye, good night, God bless, take care. If you're visiting for the, watching us for the first time, you can find out more about our church at www.tdclitchfield.org. Connect with us online at our Facebook page 
as well as it's our YouTube channel. You can upload some more videos and find a little bit more about who we are. All right, hope to see you in person one day. God bless. Have a good night. Okay, um, Andrea, yes.